Well, a very good morning, everybody. Hello. Hello, folks. Good morning and welcome here to the Palladium Theatre for our first presentation of the day and also my pleasure to welcome on board one of our brand new guest speakers today. Uh, now, I was just having a quick chat with Jeff there. He has been a guest speaker for around three years. This is his first experience on a piano ship, his first time with Carnival UK. So I hope we're all going to make him feel nice and welcome. Today, talking about the man who named Australia. Let's have a big round of applause for Jeff Peters. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, my name's Jeff Peters. I'm obviously from Australia. Uh, in fact, until oh, not so long ago, my wife, Leanne, who's sitting up the back there I mean, critiquing my performance today. She doesn't criticise, so I keep forgetting. Um, we lived on the beautiful Sunshine Coast in Queensland. But uh, three years ago, we retired, and now we travel full time. We purchased this boat in Southampton in, uh, in England, and after cruising along the Channel Coast and into the Thames and up to London, we took the boat across the Channel to uh, Dunkirk in France. And so now we spend about five months of every year cruising around the rivers and the canals of, of Europe. And some of you may know that most of the rivers in Europe are connected by man-made canals. And this is the way produce used to be delivered back before the days before trucks and trains, and etc., uh, were invented. And so there's a wonderful network of, of canals and rivers that you can go virtually anywhere in, in Europe, which is great fun for us. Uh, it's a very, very relaxing sort of, sort of uh, experience. If you want to go up into uh, altitude, you go through a series of locks in the same way if you're coming down from altitude, you come through the locks. But you're only travelling at six knots, so that's a brisk walking pace. So you're forced to slow down, you're forced to relax and take in all your surroundings and it's, it's just a wonderful experience. And gentlemen, I can tell you it's wonderful for your marriage as well. I can honestly say that Lee and I have not had one single argument or disagreement the whole time we've been on the boat. We've had several mutinies. <laughs> mutinies are, are quite similar to arguments except that in this case I get to win them because I'm the master and the commander, so it, it makes for good fun. But um, yeah, we, at the end of the season, around about October, when it gets too cold for us, we put the boat into hibernation somewhere. It's currently in a little village in, uh, in Germany, and we go off and do other things. And just by sheer good luck and good fortune, one of those other things has got to be uh, travelling around the world on beautiful cruise ships, giving speaking presentations. So uh, we're very, very lucky, we're very blessed, touch wood. Um, but a bit about my background, uh, I joined the Royal Australian Navy when I was 15 years old. At the time, I was the youngest person serving the Australian Defence Forces. I thought I'd been a pretty good kid growing up, but um, because of my age, my mum had to co-sign my enlistment documentation. She did so without a moment's hesitation, so perhaps I wasn't quite as good as I, I thought I was. But um, as soon as we, w we were living in Melbourne at the time, and as soon as I was sworn in, we were put on a plane and transferred to the other side of the continent, to Fremantle, where we were yesterday, and I went to the Naval College there. And um, we did normal schoolwork, like maths, science, English, that sort of thing, but we also did naval specific studies as well, like navigation, boat handling, seamanship, uh, drill, we did lots and lots of drill. But we also did um, a subject called Naval and Maritime History. And that's when I first developed what has since been a lifelong passion with the adventurers and the explorers of the sea. And over the next few weeks, however long it's going to be even until we get to wherever we're going to, uh, <laughs> I'm going to be speaking to you about some of these people. And I think you'll see as it overlap, over, uh, time develops how these sort of stories overlap and intertwine with each other. And you might get a, a better understanding of how history is all fitted together. So starting today with the man who named Australia, or the voyages of Matthew Flinders. And this could have been called the voyages of Matthew Flinders, it could have been called the greatest navigational race in history, it could have been called the greatest um, expedition, expedition in history. But we'll get through to that uh, a little bit later on. But Matthew Flinders was born in Lincolnshire, England in 1774. He once told people that he was induced to go to sea against the wishes of his family and friends after reading the great book Robinson Crusoe. He joined the Royal Navy at the age of 15, as all good sailors do, uh, in 1790, and the same year he was promoted to midshipman. And he joined Captain Bly on the second breadfruit voyage, again, on HMS Providence. So 
Most of you will know the story of, of the first breadfruit voyage, with the, which culminated in the, the mutiny on the bounty, where Bly went to Tahiti, they cultivated breadfruit. They were supposed to take it to Tahiti uh, to feed the, um, to be a, a cheap source of food for the slaves on the plantations in the West Indies. Um, sorry, yeah, in the West Indies. Um, but the mutiny happened, Bly was put into a long boat, and when he eventually got back to England, the Admiralty gave him a second chance. They gave him HMS Providence and said, go and complete your mission. So he took Flinders and, and uh, other sailors and they went out to uh, Tahiti. They collected the breadfruit and the plants and then they took those around to the West Indies uh, to the slave plantations. And in doing so, they circumnavigated the world. Now, Bly was very, very impressed, impressed with this young man, Matthew Flinders his seamanship ability, his communication ability, but also his navigation ability. And when they got back to England, he, uh, he wrote in his reports, glowing reports about, uh, about Flinders. And that came to the attention of another great Englishman, um, Sir Joseph Banks, who went on to be a mentor for Flinders. Now, in 1795, Flinders accompanied uh, the, a, a voyage to New Holland, which we now know as Australia. This was aboard HMS Reliance, and the idea was to take the, the new governor of New South Wales, Captain John Hunter, out to the new colony. Now, Hunter had a very interesting ex uh, career himself. He had joined the Royal Navy at the age of 13 as a captain steward, and he worked his way through every single rank of the Royal Navy up to and including captain of his own vessel. And he was actually the captain of HMS Sirius, which is the flagship of the first fleet that brought the first convicts out to Australia. And he, in doing so, he became the very first person to captain a ship sailing through Sydney Heads into what was then called Port Jackson, which we now know as Sydney Harbour. Um, the, uh, the first governor, Arthur Phillip, had uh, uh, relinquished his, uh, his tenure as governor. Uh, when that happened, the, the Admiralty put up their hands and saying, who else would like to be, who'd like to be the second governor? There wasn't many people who really wanted to come all the way around the world to the other side of the world and run a penal colony um, with the pretty austere conditions at the time. But Hunter put up his hand and he was eventually selected. So he went from, as I said, Captain Stewart all the way up to, to governor of New South Wales. Also on board was a man by the name of George Bass, who um, was the surgeon on board the, the uh, Reliance. He had actually grown up only 11 miles away from Matthew Flinders, but they never met until they boarded the ship together. The ship together. They became very, very close friends. And another man on board the, the vessel was a man by the name of Benelong, an Aboriginal man. He had befriended the first fleet when they came out uh, originally in 1880, uh, sorry, eight, uh, 1788, and um, he was taken back to England to meet King George III but he was now on his way back to rejoin his people. When, uh, during this sea voyage, he became quite ill and he was nursed back to health by uh, George Bass, the surgeon. And in return, Benelong taught Bass and Flinders a lot of the Aboriginal dialect, a lot of the language of, the, of New South Wales, which was coming very handy for them down the track. Now, you're probably all, there's a place in Sydney uh, which has been named Benelong Point after Benelong. And you've probably all seen it. You've probably all taken a photograph of it because that's where the Sydney Opera House sits. So you've all seen that landmark. And also on board was a cat by the name of Trim, but we'll cover Trim a little bit later on. Now, when they got to the new colony, Bass and Flinders did some exploring. Bass had a nine-foot boat, long boat, that uh, was called Tom Thumb, and they explored 100 miles north of um, Port Jackson, which we now know as Sydney. Uh, and along the way, they met a lot of Aboriginal people. And because of the, the dialect, the, the languages they were taught by Benelong, they were able to communicate with those people and, and got on quite well. And then a little bit later on, they took another vessel, which was known as Tom Thumb II. It was slightly bigger. And along with a, a cabin boy, they explored 100 uh, miles south of uh, Port Jackson, once again, being able to communicate with local Aboriginal people and map that coastline to find out what was along there. Now, at the time, this was the map of New Holland. The Dutch had explored the northern part of, of the continent and most of the western part of the continent. Some of the southern part of the continent along here had also been explored by the Dutch. And the Dutch 
and the French had also come to the bottom of Van Diemen's Land, or what we now know as Tasmania. But all this area here and down here was unexplored by anyone. So Bass was given instructions by Governor Hunter to go south and see what he could find. Now, at the time, everyone assumed that um, Van Diemen's Land was attached to the Australian mainland. But he travelled down south, and when he got down to near where we now know was Melbourne, he was blown out to sea again by these, these storms and by the, the winds coming through what we now know as Bass Strait. He couldn't get any further south. So when he went uh, back to Port Jackson, he reported that he believed that uh, Van Diemen's Land must be an island. There must be a channel or a strait running through there because of the currents that he had experienced. So Flinders was given instructions to take uh, a vessel, a larger vessel, uh, HMS New, uh, Newport down to, sorry, Norfolk, down to um, investigate. Now Norfolk was the very first uh, British vessel ever constructed in Australia, what we now know as Australia. So he went down and he was actually able to circumnavigate Van Diemen's Land and confirm that this was an island. And then when he went back to Port Jackson, he requested that the, the strait that he had sailed through be named after his best friend, which became Bass Strait, and you've all sailed through that. And the largest island in Bass Strait was named Flinders Island after Matthew Flinders, and because of his discovery. He then um, travelled with the, the Norfolk further north, uh, investigating uh, Moreton Bay, which is where the city of Brisbane is located, and then went even further north again uh, to Harvey Bay in Queensland. In 1800, he returned to England, and as I said, he became um, the protege of Sir Joseph Banks, who took a big interest in Flinders' career. But another person who had a, taken a big interest in this great southern continent was Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, he was after more conquests for the French people, and he wanted to explore this great southern continent to see uh, there was any opportunities for France there. There was a lot of talk at the time amongst Europeans that perhaps this wasn't just one continent, perhaps it was two continents. And it was thought that there was a gulf or a, um, a channel running all the way from the Gulf of Carpentaria to the north, all the way through to the Great Australian Bight in the south. The British had claimed the eastern part of this continent, but no one had actually claimed the western part. So perhaps there was an opportunity for France. So he decided to commission an expedition to go and uh, in, to see for himself and see what they could claim for France. And this started what was became known as the Great Navigational Race between Matthew Flinders and a Frenchman by the name of Nicolas Baudin. Now, Baudin was born a commoner in France in 1754. At the age of 15, he joined the, the Merchant Navy, but uh, during the American War of Independence, uh, he joined the, the Marine Royale, the French Navy, and fought uh, in, for the French Navy. And then after that war, uh, he returned back to the Merchant Navy. He did a lot of... Uh, uh, slavery work along the African coast, which was around the Mauritius area, which was known at the time as the Isle de France. And during one of those voyages, he met some Austrian scientists, and he took them on voyages around um, the Indian Ocean along the African coast. And it turned out that he had a very natural instinct for science, especially botany. Uh, he was a great navigator, but he was also a very skilled scientist, and they taught him more and more as the years went by. So. With that expertise, he had both strings to his bow, the, the seamanship and navigational side, but also the science side. So Napoleon thought that he'd be the perfect person to choose to lead this expedition to the great southern land. He'd actually gone on a, a voyage to the Caribbean, or the Caribbean, uh, and while he was there, he discovered a new species of plant, and he'd taken that back to Paris, and they'd used some of those plants to line the, the streets of Paris when Napoleon returned. Uh, after one of his big triumph in the, the um, campaign, in the Italian campaigns. Uh, so he'd come to Napoleon's notice then. But in 1800, he was selected to join, to lead this great voyage. Before he could leave, though, he needed a passport of safe conduct from the British. Now, this was a fairly standard sort of thing to do. Uh, if you were, weren't a combatant, because France and England were at war at the time, if you weren't um, involved in that, if you were on a humanitarian mission or a scientific mission, you could apply for a passport of safe conduct, which meant that you weren't allowed to have any part in the war, you weren't allowed to gain 
any intelligence or anything like that. You had no impact on the war whatsoever. You could receive this passport of safe conduct. And it took a few months for it to come through, but eventually it did. Now, just before he set sail, there was a change to the sailing orders. And this came from the most powerful person in France. And we all think that would be Napoleon Bonaparte, but in this case it wasn't. It was his wife, Josephine. We all know that the, the wives are more important, don't we? Um, and she ordered uh, that as many live samples be brought back as possible. It was normal at that time to bring back um, uh, dead samples of animals and plants and, and insects and fish and all those sorts of things, but she didn't want that. She wanted live samples of these things. So that was going to make a huge impact on this expedition. So they set sail on the 19th of October, 1800, uh, with two ships, the Geograph and the Nautilus. On board were 22 scientists, made up of naturalists, zoologists, biologists, there was artists on board as well. And these were all um, men that were going to clash with Bodarn. Um, a lot of these men had born, been born to noble blood. They'd gone to university. They'd studied all their lives. They resented the fact that this man who was in charge of them was just a gifted amateur uh, and that he was, he was a commoner, but he was going to give these noblemen orders. And the, the leader of the scientists was a man by the name of Francois Perron, and there was going to be issues all the way through this voyage with Perron. Now, in the meantime, the English had been alerted to the fact that the French were going to be sniffing around the great southern continent. So they wanted to send their own navigator as well. So Matthew Flinders was given command of HMS Investigator, which was a collier, which is a, a ship that used to haul coal around. It was very good because they had fairly flat bottoms. They could go in, in uh, uh, where there was not much water, shallow water. Um, and the other reason this ship was, was chosen was because it was surplus to the requirements of the Royal Navy. They didn't need it in their war against France. It was, it was an old ship. Uh, it wasn't in very good condition. So the Royal Navy were happy to, to see it go. So he was promoted uh, to, at the time. And then on the 17th of April, before he left, he married Anne Chappelle. And he promised his new bride that he would take her with him on this voyage to New Holland, even though that was strictly against Royal Navy orders. But as it was, Anne was on board where they sailed from Spithead uh, on the 18th of July, and that was a full nine months after Bodan had already sailed. When the ship arrived in Plymouth a couple of weeks later, uh, Anne was discovered to have been on board, and she was ordered off by the Admiralty. And the Admiralty wasn't very happy with Matthew Flinders at all. They said to him, you've got a choice. It's either the mission or the missus. What's it going to be? And so uh, Flinders went to Anne and said, well, I'm only going to be gone for three years. This is going to be wonderful for our, uh, our life together. It's going to be great for my career, which means it's going to be uh, handy for us down the, down the track. I'll see you in three years. And he chose the mission. Now, in the meantime, Bodan was sailing down the west coast of Africa. He had these 22 scientists on board who weren't used to these conditions. They weren't used to taking orders from a commoner, but they also weren't used to the conditions aboard a cramped, uh, close ship. It wasn't anything like this ship, for example. Now, this was the equivalent of having 22 kids in the back seat saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And so it was very frustrating for everyone concerned. Because the ship was going on a, a large expedition, there was, there was provisions and, and uh, livestock everywhere, and these scientists had to step over all, the, all this equipment to get about. It didn't help either that they sailed into the doldrums, which was an area of absolutely no wind, very high humidity, very, very hot, uh, oppressive conditions on board these, these vessels, and they were stuck in the doldrums for several weeks before the, um, the wind started blowing, and they were able to get out. But in the meantime, the scientists were blaming Bodan for, for uh, steering them into the, that area anyway. They went around the Cape of Good Hope at the bottom of South Africa and arrived in the Isle de France, or Mauritius as we now know it. And when they were there, they took on um, a supply of plants. So these were, were citrus trees, apple trees, uh, uh, vegetables, all these types of things. And there was two reasons for that. The first one was it was going to supplement their supplies on board the ship. But the main reason was that 
they'd been given these change of sailing orders. They had to bring back live samples of things. So the reason they wanted these plants is so they could experiment on the rest of the voyage about how to keep these trees and plants alive. You know, how much sunlight they should have, how much uh, water they, they needed to give them, things like that. Now, while they were in the Isle de France, the local governor was concerned that the British were going to invade uh, the island. So he gave an incentive to any sailor who would leave the ships and desert the ships and, and join the, the local garrison. Uh, he offered to double their salary, um, and so about 40 sailors departed from these two ships and joined the, the local army. So, I mean, they were offered, as I said, twice the salary. Uh, instead of having to go off on a long voyage, long, uncomfortable voyage to parts unknown, no one had ever uh, gone here before, um, and there was also there was obviously women on, uh, on the Isle de France as well, so it was a good incentive for them to stay. But it decimated the crew levels on these two ships. Bodan had to quickly leave to, so no one else would, uh, would uh, desert as well. But also 10 of the scientists decided they'd had enough of this voyage and they decided to head back to France as well. Now, on the 27th of May, 1801, they came to the west coast of Western Australia. So uh, they passed through what was known as uh, Cape Naturalist, which is now known as Cape Naturalist, named after one of the ships, and they anchored in um, um, uh, Geograph Bay, which is where present-day Busselton is on the coast of Western Australia. They went ashore that very first day, and they came across a local Aboriginal man who indicated that they should leave. He wasn't very, he was pretty aggressive. He wasn't very happy with them at all. But they, uh, they stayed and they planted some of the trees as a gift to the Aboriginals uh, to say that they were benefactors. They were there to, to be friends. Uh, and then the next day, another party of scientists went ashore. But at the end of the day, these scientists didn't return. Uh, there was no sign of them at all. What had happened to them? Bodan ordered that uh, lights be put up top of the mast of, of the two ships and that a cannon be fired every two hours to try and signal them uh, where the coastline was. But it was actually three days before the scientists made their way back to the coast. They'd gone wandering off and they'd gotten themselves lost. Um, when our ship's party went ashore to collect them, a storm broke up and one of the boats collapsed, uh, sorry, capsized, and uh, the boatswain, the chief boatswain, one of the most experienced men on the ship, uh, was lost, was drowned. Now, I should um, mention here about the, the ships, because uh, this will come up time and time again through the, all, the, all the lectures on board. These weren't ships like this one, where you had a lovely steel hull that uh, was, was uh, welded together, watertight doors, all those types of things. These were, these were wooden planked ships. Um, they, were very, they weren't very sturdy at all. Between those planks used to be stuffed what was known as corking. And this is usually uh, materials or pieces of wool or even old, old rope that was soaked in tar or oil or wax and prized in between the planks to try and stop the water from coming in. And over the period of time as the ship would, uh, would move, the planks would move, the corking would come out uh, or it would rot uh, over, over that time, especially the corking that was underneath the, the water line of the vessel. So these ships always had to be maintained. There was always work to be done to keep them any sort of ship shape at all. And over time, um, they, they, the woods rotted as well, which made it even more difficult. But so, so Bodan decided that the, uh, the ships were in such poor condition, he didn't want to chance a winter going underneath the bottom of New Holland because of the storms that um, uh, he was thinking were going to be along that, that coast, the, the high winds that uh, he had already experienced coming across the Indian Ocean. So he decided to turn north and head up along the West Australian coast. And he was disappointed to find that there was no real anchorages or, or ports that he could find where he could start a settlement. There was not much water that he could find. Um, they were running short on food and water and another disaster had happened. Some of the crew had come down with scurvy. Um, the, the blight of, of sailors at that time. So he put into Timor, uh, where he was allowed his men to stay for three months and try and recover from, uh, from that scurvy and do some repairs to the ships. But when they left, they left with a silent killer. They left with dysentery, um, which was going to affect the, the voyage later on as well. Now, on, on the way up the coast, Western Australian coast, the two ships got, uh, got 
separated during a storm. They met up again in Shark Bay, but Bodan decided that there wasn't enough men to be able to crew both ships, especially with the scurvy that had, uh, that had broken out. So he decided to send the Nautilus back to France, and now it was only the Geograph operating on its own. Now, in the meantime, Flinders was also coming down that African coast. Uh, he pulled into Cape Town, uh, where they conducted repairs to the ships, to his ship, the Investigator. But as they travelled across the, the, um, the roaring forties of the Indian Ocean, he was still taking in five inches of water every hour uh, into the hull of the Investigator. So the pumps had to be operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They sighted Cape Lewin, the southwestern, uh, most southwestern point of Australia, and he named that point Lewin after the first Dutch ship that had uh, come across that, that place. And then they pulled into King George Sound, which was, is Albany. So you were in, most people here were in Albany a few days ago. Uh, they anchored in King George Sound, and they went ashore, they met some Aboriginal people ashore, and they also discovered uh, two new species of plants that had never been seen before. So they're off to a pretty good start, and the crew were in pretty good condition. They were all fit and healthy. Now, in the meantime, Bodan had, um, had left Timor. He was travelling down that Western Australian coast. He came around the bottom of uh, Western Australia, Cape Lewin, but he was so far out at sea, uh, the two ships didn't see each other at all. And he went even further south, and he got to what we now know as Tasmania or Van Diemen's Land. And I'll cover uh, a bit about uh, Tasmania in a, in a talk a few, uh, in a lecture a, a few uh, days into the future, but uh, they arrived at what we now know as, as Hobart. And he met some Aboriginal people, they planted some vegetables there and some trees, including apple trees, as a gift to the local Aboriginal people. These apple trees ended up thriving in, the, in those conditions and um, went on to become the first export crop of Tasmania. And um, Tasmania is now known as the Apple Isle, all because of Bodan. He made some very non-judgmental remarks in his diary about the local Aboriginal people. He was very taken with their demeanour. But when they left Van Diemen's land, they got up to the, the southern coast of the continent of, uh, of New Holland and they started travelling uh, to the west along that coastline which we now know as Victoria and South Australia, similar to the Arcadia last couple of weeks. Now in the meantime, Flinders had left King George Sound, and he was heading east. He was frustrated by the huge cliffs that he encountered along the way, which protect the, the continent from the, the seas of the Southern Ocean. He couldn't see over the top to see what was inside this continent, until he came to what we now know as Port Lincoln in South Australia. And suddenly the continent took a turn to the north, and he thought, well, maybe this is it. Maybe this is that great channel between um, making up the dividing the two continents. Maybe this is going to lead all the way up to the Gulf of Carpentaria. But after a few days of travelling, uh, he realised that this was only a gulf. It wasn't a, a channel to the north at all. And he turned around again. He came through the Investigator Strait. Before he did that, he, so he sent some men ashore to uh, collect some water, eight men. And uh, while they were coming back, the, the storm came up, the boat capsized, all eight men were lost. So he named that place Cape Catastrophe. And the eight islands that he could see from Cape Catastrophe, he named after each of the men that uh, were lost during that voyage. He went through the Investigator Strait and named that after his ship, and he became the first person to circumnavigate Kangaroo Island. He, uh, he landed in, uh, what we, in the area we know now as Adelaide, and while he was there, he met some more Aboriginal people. He was impressed with, with them, and he came back and he wrote in his diary that he had met Australians. And this was the very first reference to the word Australians in, uh, in, in history. Um, it's Latin for the people of the great southern land. He then sailed um, along the coast, along this area here. Now, this area is now known as Encounter Bay because on the 8th of April, 1802, lookouts on both ships, Bodan's ship and um, Flinders' ship, both yelled down below that a sail was on the horizon. Now, both men took different action. Flinders drummed his men to action stations. He ran out the guns. Uh, but Bodan 
was using his passport of safe conduct, relying on that, so he didn't take any offensive action at all. The two ships decided to anchor beside each other in what we now know as Encounter Bay, and Flinders rowed over in a longboat to the Geograph and met Bodan for the first time. Now, initially there was a lot of hesitation between the two men, a lot of suspicion, but over the period of that day, they got to know each other, they got actually to like each other, even though they were rivals. They showed each other the, their own maps, they swapped charts with each other, and they both realised that there must, there's no great channel going through the middle of New Holland at all, because uh, Bodan had mapped to the, to the east and Flinders had mapped to the west. There was nothing there. So they swapped the information, and Bodan noted in his log that for Flinders' cartography work, his map-making skills were far superior to his own, where Flinders noted in his log that the samples, the, the scientific samples that Bodan had collected to date were far superior to those that he'd been able to collect. Um, so they both had a lot of respect for each other. But they were only together for the one day, and as the tide was going out that afternoon, both vessels pulled up their anchors and sailed off in different directions. Bodan heading west, Flinders heading towards the east. Now, the uh, investigator was in pretty bad condition by this stage. Uh, they were sailing along this coastline that Bodan had named Terra Napoleon on his charts, um, which we now know as the shipwreck coast of, of Victoria. And there was a huge storm, and Flinders was, was very, very... Um, lucky to survive those storms and not to become one of those ships on the shipwreck coast. He was very grateful when the coastline suddenly turned to the north and he was able to get to uh, Port Jackson. So he arrived in Sydney Cove, Port Jackson, on the 9th of May uh, and reported to Governor King, the new governor of the colony. And then he was surprised, though, that on the 20th of May, only 11 days later, the Geograph, a uh, Bodan ship, was sighted coming into Sydney Cove. Um, what had happened is that as Bodan was heading off to the west, that dysentery that they'd contracted in um, Timor suddenly hit, hit the crew. And a lot of the crew died. Most were unable to do any work at all. So Bodan knew that he had to get to the only place, the only settlement within this huge continent, um, which was Sydney Cove. So he turned around and he headed back towards uh, Port Jackson. Now, when they arrived in Port Jackson, Flinders had to send two longboats out to the Geograph to help them uh, uh, anchor because there was only eight men on board the ship that were fit to do any work at all. The rest had been struck down with dysentery. Now, when these ships had left, France and Britain were at war, and as far as they knew, they were still at war. But um, the uh, information had gotten to Port Jackson that peace had broken out uh, between the two countries. So Bodan was received by Governor King with great fanfare. He was given a... Bodan was given an 11-gun salute. Uh, there was a big party at Government House uh, to celebrate Bastille Day uh, and a feast there for Bodan and his men. Now, Flinders, by this stage, had done some repairs to the investigator and he wanted to get a jump on Bodan. So he left in July and headed north, trying to do a detailed survey, a detailed cartography of that uh, coastline along the Queensland coast, including the, the Great Barrier Reef, and then up along the northern coast of Australia, the Gulf of Carpentaria. But Bodan stayed in, in Port Jackson. He and King became very good friends. They often dined together at Government House. And they spent four months in Port Jackson. And while they were there, the scientists, Bodan and his scientists, spent a lot of time with the local Aboriginal people. They treated them much differently to the British. For the British, this was a penal colony, so there was convicts. There was guards there, soldiers there to guard the convicts, and there was a few settlers there who were trying to uh, carve out a piece of this land uh, so they could survive in this, in this new land. Uh, and so they had a different sort of reaction to the Aboriginal people than the French there, who were scientists. They were interested in the culture and the, the history of the Aboriginal people, and they wanted to know more about it. So they, there was a lot more respect from the French to the Aboriginals, and that was reciprocated. The French were actually invited to a, an Aboriginal coavery, which was a celebration of, of dance and music, and the French wrote the score of that coavery. Um, while they were, the French were there, they collected more than 40,000 samples um, with drawings and, and uh, specimens um, 
from, from that region, which was an incredible amount. They did a lot of, as I said, interaction with the Aboriginal people, and some of the drawings that they did were, are now famous uh, for the detail and the, um, um, the animals that they discovered while they were here. So when Bodan's men were, were fit to sail again, he decided that there was no point following in the wake of Flinders, who had gone north, so he decided that he would turn back south again and go down to Van Diemen's Land. Now, Van Diemen's Land had been visited by the French before the British had ever gotten there. Um, so there was talk amongst the French scientists, and Perron had told one of the British soldiers, that they, British officers, that they intended to claim Van Diemen's Land for France. So when Governor King heard about this, he dispatched HMS Cumberland, to pursue Bodan and tell them they couldn't do that. They caught up with Bodan on King Island in, um, in Bass Strait. Um, British Marines went ashore and they fired a volley into the air. They raised a the British flag and they told Bodan that we've claimed this island, we've claimed it, Van Diemen's land, we've claimed everything around here um, that you can, everything within um, um, the region. Now, Bodan was disappointed with this. Uh, he wrote to Governor King um, with a melancholy sort of um, attitude. He said that he never had any intention of claiming this land uh, for France. He, uh, he didn't see how either Britain or France could possibly have any claim over this land because it was already occupied by a noble race of people. So they, no country had any right to, to claim it, which was a very progressive sort of attitude for its time. And once again, it was an attitude that was going to cause Bodan problems down the track. He sailed uh, west again and then along the north along the Western Australian coast trying to get to Timor. Now when he got there, once again, his ship, the Geograph, was in terrible condition, his crew were in terrible condition and he himself had contracted tuberculosis. And he was so sick that the ship's surgeon wrote in the ship's log on two occasions that he didn't expect his captain to survive for more than a few hours. But he did survive, he did recover to a degree, um, and he kept on pushing his men. He kept on trying to collect more samples along the way. Uh, he pushed the ship and he pushed his men nearly to the breaking limit. And it wasn't until some of the plants and animals that he had collected along the way, the live specimens that he had, started to get ill themselves, that he decided that no, enough's enough, we've got to get this treasure uh, that we've collected back to France. So he decided that he would turn around and make for the Isle de France. Now, Flinders, on the other hand, he had um, gone to the northern part of Australia, the Gulf of Carpentaria. He was doing a detailed survey along that coastline, but he was striking the, the monsoons. The investigator was in such poor shape now that he had to beach it onto a, uh, run it up onto a beach and try and do repairs to it uh, on that beach. But um, in March 1803, he realised that there was no chance of de doing a detailed survey uh, of the, this country, and he, he abandoned that, and he decided he'd head back to Port Jackson. He couldn't go back the way he'd come, because that would be fighting against the monsoon winds. So he had to go all the way around, what we now know as Western Australia, down the bottom of Australia, all the way around there to Sydney Cove, um, which, in doing so, he... Uh, completed the very first circum close circumnavigation of Australia. But 19 of his crew members died. When the investigator finally arrived in uh, Port Jackson, it was condemned as being unseaworthy and, and destroyed. Now, Flinders knew that Bodan had got the jump on him by this stage. So he immediately collected all his logs and his charts and his specimens that he had uh, collected, and he boarded one of three ships that was going back to England just as a passenger, not as an officer, just as a, a normal passenger. And he decided to take off. But along the way, I mean, a lot of people from outside Australia think that everything in Australia is trying to kill you. Uh, snakes, spiders, sharks, all these sort of things. But back in those days, the most deadly thing um, wasn't the reptiles, it was the reefs surrounding Australia. And two of the three ships struck a reef on the Great Barrier Reef. Now, luckily, they were close to a large sandbar, and all the men from those two ships were able to transfer over to these sandbars, where they set up a camp, um, they raised a flag 
uh, upside down, which is the international code for I'm in distress, and, um, and they waited. Now, the third ship that was travelling with them, the Bridgewater, had seen what had happened, but it continued to sail on, kept on going, didn't stop to provide assistance. And when they got back to England, they, the captain of the Bridgewater reported that the other two ships had been lost with all hands. When it was later discovered that this wasn't true, the captain was court-martialed and he was drummed out of the Royal Navy for cowardice. Now, in the meantime, Flinders and the other men realised that there was no chance that they were going to be rescued by someone else. They had to take action themselves. So because of his small boating experience with Tom Thumb and Tom Thumb II and, and the, um, um, the Norfolk, he volunteered to take 13 men on an open boat voyage 600 miles south to uh, Port Jackson. A, an, an amazing open voyage in an, in an open boat. And he arrived in Port Jackson. He walked into the Governor House as, as uh, Governor King was having dinner and reported what had happened. And he jumped on board the Cumberland and he led a rescue mission back to the, uh, the sandbar and rescued all but three of the men who had, um, had been stuck there. Uh, three men had died during that ordeal. Now, two of the men that he rescued was, one of them was his brother, who had been on the expedition with him, and one was a man by the name of John Franklin, who I'll talk about in another presentation down the track a bit. When they returned uh, to Port Jackson, Flinders took command of the Cumberland, once again taking all these samples and, and uh, his logs and his charts, and he uh, took the Cumberland and set sail for England. Now, in the meantime, Baudin uh, had reached the Isle de France, or Mauritius, but he was gravely ill by this stage. And on the 16th of September, 1803, he died. And he's buried in an unmarked grave in, uh, in Mauritius. And we were in Mauritius this time last year, and I can tell you there's absolutely no sign of, of Nicholas Baudin. You will not find his grave in, in Mauritius, which is unfortunate. Um, also unfortunate to, for Baudin was the fact that Perron, the chief scientist, now took charge of the mission. And he sailed back to France and arrived there three and a half years after they'd left. And on board they had 200,000 articles of specimens of plants, animals, fish, um, insects, including 2,543 species that had never ever been seen before in the world. So that made up another 50% of what was known uh, at the time, of, of plants and animals that were known at the time. So that's just an incredible sort of thing. Um, and it's, it's easy to say, but I mean, to put it in, in modern perspective, if, if NASA or Elon Musk or Richard Branson had sent a spacecraft into, into space three and a half years ago, and as soon as it was out of sight, we lost all communication with it. We didn't know where it was, if it was safe, uh, if they were alive. We didn't know anything about the spacecraft at all. And then today, after three and a half years, it suddenly, out of nowhere, it's returned to Earth. And it's got 200,000 specimens. It's got 2,543 plants, animals, fish, whatever, that has never, ever been seen in the world before. Could you imagine what sort of stir that would cause um, amongst the world today? It was just, it, if it was going to increase the specimens that we knew by 50%, it would just be an amazing sort of experience. Now, Sir, um, Sir Joseph Banks heard about this. Britain and France were at war again at this stage, but Sir Joseph Banks received permission from Napoleon to travel to Paris to see this great collection. And when he did, even though Britain and, and England, uh, sorry, Britain and France were enemies and they were rivals, um, he declared this the greatest scientific expedition of all time. Josephine Bonaparte met the ships at the, the quay and she ordered that uh, all the, most of the animals and the plants be transferred to her um, palace at Malmaison. And there's still a, um, there was a sort of Australian, small Australian zoo there, and there's still a Australian biosphere uh, at Malmaison. And you can go and see the, the, um, the, uh, the plants, the Australian plants that uh, were planted there. Now, Perron, the chief scientist, petitioned to Napoleon that he be given permission to write the official account of this voyage, this great voyage, and Napoleon agreed to it. And this official account runs to thousands and thousands of pages. And in that, the, um, the person who led this great 
expedition, this great scientific expedition, for 95 or 99 percent of the voyage, uh, Bodan is only mentioned in the whole document once. And that's only, and not, not even by name. All it says is that a captain died in uh, Isle de France. That's the only mention of Bodan whatsoever, which is one of the great um, um, unjust uh, things in science ever. Um, now, also, his, Bodan's reputation was destroyed by, um, by Perron. Uh, he mentioned, Perron mentioned to Napoleon that Bodan had had the opportunity to claim Van Diemen's land for the French, but it had refused to do so. So Napoleon famously said that Bodan did well to die because upon his return, I'd have had him hung. Now, the other thing that, um, that Perron did was he changed the names that Bodan had given to certain parts of this great new continent, and which is something you don't do. But he'd also changed the names of um, some of the names that Flinders had given to the continent as well when they'd exchanged charts. And once again, this is just something you don't do to another explorer. Now, in the meantime, Flinders was on his way back to England aboard HMS Cumberland. Um, now, he was, had to go around the Cape of Good Hope, which was, uh, had a reputation of being lots and lots of storms, very difficult to get around there. So he decided that he didn't want to take the chance with the Cumberland and the condition it was, so he reluctantly decided that he would pull into the Isle de France to conduct repairs. Now, when he arrived, he arrived just one day after Perron and the other, and the Geograph had set sail for, for, for France. Now, that one day was going to cause huge problems for him because when he got there, France and Britain were at war again and he was immediately arrested. He showed them the, um, the, the passport of safe conduct that he had, um, but this was for the investigator, and he was now on board the Cumberland. So the local governor of the Isle de France put him in prison, and he was in prison for six years until he was released on 13th of June, uh, 1810, and was able to return to England. So he arrived in England 10 years after he'd left. He had a little bit of explaining to do to his wife, um, and he was in very poor condition by this stage himself, physically in poor condition. And he used the last of his health to write uh, his account of his voyage. He'd all read the account that, Bo that uh, Perron had written on, for the Bodan voyage, and he wanted to put his uh, case forward as well. Uh, he didn't quite use the last of his energy to do that because he did father a child with, with Anne, but um, he died at the age of 40 on the 9th of July, 1814. Just one day, just one day again, he doesn't have much luck with these days, just one day before his great work, the, um, A Voyage to Terror Australis, was published. And this caused a sensation around the world, his account of, of what had happened. And in this document, for the very first time, he advocates for the name Australia uh, to be used for this continent, which is Latin for the great southern land. And eventually, of course, it was. So... He goes down in history as one of the great navigators of all time. There's uh, around Australia, in every state of Australia, there's statues and, and things named after him. Flinders Chase National Park is named for him. Uh, Flinders Street in Melbourne. Um, Flinders Ranges, the mountain range. There's statues everywhere to him. But uh, unfortunately, Bodan, the man who led the greatest scientific expedition in history, uh, there's not much known about him at all. We're starting to... to um, See a few things. This was yesterday at the Chipwreck Museum or the, National, the Maritime Museum in Fremantle. Um, so there's a, probably three or four statues to Bodan in Western Australia alone. But that's still more than in the entire country of France. In uh, 2011, a survey was done and 97% of Frenchmen have never heard of this great national hero. He's more well known outside the country. Now, while he was... Um, I mentioned before about a cat named Trim. So Kim, Trim was actually born on the Reliance during that very first voyage out to New Holland when um, uh, Flinders was only a, a young midshipman or lieutenant. The cat had fallen overboard and the crew were really surprised to see it use its claws to um, come, scamper up this wooden hull of the ship uh, and get on board. So Flinders decided it was a lucky cat and he adopted it. He called it Trim 
and it was his constant companion for all of his voyages on Tom Thumb, Tom Thumb 2, and his circumnavigation of Australia, and uh, it was even in prison with him on the Isle de France. And sometime during that, uh, that time on the Isle de France, Trim went missing. And there was a reward posted for it, but he was never found. He was probably taken by a hungry slave and, and eaten. But uh, Matthew Flynn has wrote a, a book called Trim, uh, which became a bestseller. Um, and it's a great read if anyone wants to borrow it. Uh, last year, in January, the remains of Matthew Flinders were discovered under Platform 15 at Euston Station in London. Uh, they were doing some remodelling of, of the station and they uh, brought up his remains. There was a lot of talk at the time about whether they would um, uh, bring him out to Australia and bury him in Australia, but eventually he was taken back to Lincolnshire and buried uh, uh, back there. As I said, there's lots of monuments and, and uh, uh, kudos to, to Bass and Flinders, but this is the only, this is in uh, statues in Encounter Bay in South Australia, and it's the only time that the, the two men, the two great uh, explorers and rivals, have their statues together. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the story of the man who named Australia. I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, my next talk is in a couple of days' time. It's the story of the mutiny on the Batavia. Now, it is the absolutely true story of uh, mutiny, murder, sexual slavery, outstanding seamanship, um, revenge. Now, I have to warn you that it's a fairly graphic, sort of confronting sort of talk. It actually makes the mutiny on the bounty look like a Walt Disney fairy tale. So I'll see you then, if you dare. But in the meantime, Shelley's going to come up in a, in a few minutes and she's going to give you some lessons on belly dancing. And if I stay on cruise ships any longer, I'm going to have a lot more material to work with, I can tell you. <laughs> if you see us around the ship, say hello.